finish the phrase for me. Haste makes waste. Is it true? Sometimes it is, isn't it? Sometimes hurrying, being uh, overly exuberant to achieve a goal, perhaps of questionable value, does indeed lead to waste. We can be so impatient to achieve a certain goal that even when our intentions are good, we can still mess things up. Sad but true, isn't it? Haste can indeed make waste. Impatience, generally speaking, does not serve us well. And perhaps that is, there's no other area where that is more true than in the area of Bible study. Have you ever thought about how the world would be different if people truly studied the Word of God as they should? What difference would that make? How would it change, for instance, the evening news, right? Uh, you come home after work. Uh, uh, you, you find your favorite newscast. Would it change anything in what you saw if the world were studying the Bible as they should? How would your job or the school where you attend, would it be different if people studied the Bible unhurriedly looking for the truth no matter what it would cost them, not impatiently, but waiting for the Lord to speak through His Word? How would the world be different? You know, I think that question, those questions, are extremely important right now. Very important. Because you see, there's at least two lies that are floating around the world when it comes to the Bible. That, lie number one, I'll just put it up here on the screen. Uh, the Bible is too complicated to be understood by anyone but a specialist. Okay, you've got to get your master's in something, right? Uh, you've got to get your doctorate in something. And then, then, perhaps then you'll be able to rightly interpret the Word of God. Other than that, <clears throat> mere mortals, amateurs, should not attempt it, right? Um, <clears throat> while it's true it is not spoken of near as often, uh, for many years, uh, the, uh, the Roman Catholic Church had the Scriptures specifically as being essentially the property of what they called the magisterium. It was the collection of specialists. They would be the ones to interpret it. And the Protestant Reformation, as we're going to see in the month of October, I hope you're able to join us then, uh, took that and turned it on its head and said that actually most of the Bible is simple. We can understand it. For God so loved the world, for instance, that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's so simple, even NFL fans get it placed, pasted over their games. Okay? There's a second lie, though, that is more subtle than the first. And I think sometimes it does more damage. And given our human proclivity, that's a great word, isn't it? Proclivity. Our bent to being impatient. This lie can often cause more damage than the first. And the lie goes like this. All of the Bible is simple and should be applied to all people's lives throughout all time and in all places equally without any interpretation. Hmm. Sometimes this is expressed like this. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. Now, I got to tell you, that most of the time is a great attitude to have. God is not looking for us to quarrel with him every time that we open the Bible. When it says, for instance, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, it's great to say, you know, the Lord has said this to us. Let us embrace it. Let's live it. Let's believe it. Let's move forward. But there are also portions of Scripture that if we take that attitude, things may not only go wrong for us, they may go terribly wrong for us and other people. Uh, and if you're not convinced, uh, let me just give you some examples. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.26 Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. Now, if this is something that is equally applicable to all peoples in all, all times and all places, you are in apostasy because not a single one... No, it's not true. My wife gave me a kiss this morning before I came to church. She greeted this brother at least with a holy kiss. Okay? And I am grateful for your disobedience because I don't want you to greet me with a holy kiss when I come to church. Thank you, Brother Mike. I appreciate your disobedience. Please keep it up. Yes, you feel the same way, don't you? Yeah, all right. 
And yet, friends, this is a command. This is in what we call the imperative mode in Greek. It is a command. Paul says, greet all the brothers, not just one, with a holy kiss. This has gotten more than one man in trouble. How about this text? Make it a little harder. Proverbs chapter 25, 21, and 22. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. Oh, so far, so good, right? In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. Now, I know that some of you have been participating in this because your head is clear this morning. There's no hair on top of it, and clearly this burning coal ministry has found its way into your life, okay? We're glad that you're here. When I was a kid, I didn't even think twice about this. I thought to myself, well, you know, it's in the Bible. This is a good thing. When I got older, and I thought, now, why don't we have a burning coal ministry at our church? Why don't we save what leftovers from the barbecue, right, and use it for our enemies to keep coals of fire? If you stop and think about it, there is no application to this that makes sense in our culture today. By being nice to your enemy, you're going to burn the follicles right off of his head. Pity the poor soul that takes this literally. Okay. Pity the poor soul that is on the receiving end of the one who takes this literally. Okay. How about this? Mark 16, 18. Jesus is speaking of those who believe in him, minister for him, witness for him. It says, They will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. Now, if you are of the opinion that all Scripture is completely simple and should be taken for all time, everywhere, equally applied to all people, then you will do what a number of people have done, for instance, in certain portions of Appalachia. There are churches that are dedicated to this, these particular practices, handling of snakes and the drinking of poison. I'll just cut to the bottom line. Not all of them make it through the experience. Okay? But many of them who have died from their snake bite, for instance, have died in the assurance that they died, quote, faithful to the word. Or how about this one? Let's make it harder still. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 to 15. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She must be silent. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. That is quite a text. And of course, it is not a coincidence that I bring this particular text Beginning on October the 5th, uh, there will be the annual council gathering of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It will take place in Silver Spring, Maryland, there at the General Conference headquarters. A uh, spacious room. There'll be plenty of room for the hundreds of delegates that are coming uh, from all over the world for this very important annual meeting. All annual councils are important. It's there that we deal with issues that are uh, confronting the church. This is where uh, some of our best thinking is done, and we hope some of our best voting as we form and shape uh, policies and guidance for the worldwide Seventh-day Adventist Church. Uh, we do not have a pope. We have instead a plurality of leaders representing various portions of the body of Christ all over the world. And generally speaking, annual councils have very good things that result from them. October 5 will begin a week's worth of deliberations over, well, I can't say that it's over this particular text, but it is. This particular text, in fact, will probably never even be, been, be mentioned. The role of women in ministry probably isn't going to be mentioned, at least in the official agenda, but it will undoubtedly be behind the scenes ever so evident. Perhaps even one could say it's texts like 1 Timothy 2 that have brought the issues and the agenda of this particular council to the fore. I would invite you to pay close attention to what I'm going to share next because it's important. These are interesting times in the church and in the world that we live in. I take comfort in the words of the Apostle Peter. Uh, Peter said in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16, speaking of the writings of Paul, he said that Paul writes some things that are, quote, hard 
to understand. I take comfort in that. If even an apostle, Peter, struggled to understand the words of another apostle, Paul, if I have some struggles with it, I'm probably in pretty good company, aren't I? And so here's what I'd like to suggest that we do this morning. I'd like us to take a look at some basic rules for solidly interpreting the Bible. We're not going to spend a huge amount of time on it. We're just going to go through some basic rules for interpreting the Bible rightly. And then, just in case someone is interested, we're going to apply it to this text. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 to 15. So without further ado, let's get right to it. There are six rules that I want to share with you for interpreting the Bible correctly. Six rules, okay? Uh, these are simple ones. By the way, people write entire books about this particular topic, so we're not going to cover every single thing, but we're going to give you a good foundation, okay? So if you're the kind of person that likes to write things down, you might want to grab a piece of paper. Six rules for interpreting the Bible correctly. Number one, read the passage you're studying. How's that for rocket science? You'd be surprised, though, how many people don't. Many people, in fact, have argued uh, strongly, uh, 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 hardly against a certain position when actually they haven't taken the time to read it for themselves. Don't let it happen to you, okay? So if you're going to study the Bible, it is very helpful to say, okay, I'm going to read this passage. I'm going to read it several times. I'm even going to read it out loud, okay? Because remember, originally, most people did not read the Bible. They heard it, okay? They heard it. Someone else would be reading it from the front, and so they would hear this, read it out loud, so you can kind of at least get a taste of what it was like when they heard the words of Scripture. Read it in several different translations. Some of you have a number of translations of the Bible on your shelves. That's perfect. Put them all side by side with that passage open to it. You can also go online. There's places like uh, BibleGateway.com or BibleHub.com. Excellent resources. You can choose from all sorts of translations, and you can put them all side by side right there on your computer screen. A great tool to do it. You need to read the passage carefully that you're studying. Number two, define key terms correctly. Define key terms correctly. Uh, remember, the Bible was not written in English. I know it's hard to believe. I'm, I'm told, actually, that it was originally written in Spanish. Is that true? Is that what happened? Okay, in, in heaven we'll be speaking Spanish, etc. Okay, but until then, probably most of you have an English translation. The Bible was written originally in Hebrew, Greek, and a smidgen of Aramaic. And so what that means is, is that sometimes the words that are translated into English are not the only possibility of how to translate that particular word. Well, how do you find out those things if you're not an expert in Greek or Hebrew? It's simple. Put those translations next to one another. Go online. Again, Bible Gateway, Bible Hub, whatever it is that you use. Put those translations next to one another. You will find where there are differences in translating a particular word. That tells you that probably there are some acceptable variations in that original Hebrew or Greek or maybe Aramaic word. So you need to define those things carefully. Number three, consider carefully the context of the passage. And there's two kinds of context that I want to share with you today, literary and historical. Now, context, one of my favorite illustrations for it, some of you have heard it before, I'll say it again. If I come to your house in mid-August, uh, it's about 95 degrees outside, 110% humidity, I knock on your door and I say, can I have some water? you're probably going to study the context for a brief moment. It's hot outside. Yeah, 95 degrees, really humid out here. Shane's my neighbor. He's probably been out working his yard all day. He's thirsty, so I'm going to get him some water. Okay? Now imagine a week later, my house is on fire. I sprint down to your house, and I say to you when you open the door, I need some water. exact same words as before. But the context makes all the difference in the world. People that refuse to study context in the Bible are dangerous. They are dangerous people. Now, how do we study context? How do we do it? It's actually fairly simple. There's two kinds here that I just want to... There are others, but we'll just stick with these. Literary context. Just think of it as kind of uh, uh, like dropping a, a rock in a pond and these ripples that go out. Uh, start with the closest ripple. If you're going to read one verse, why don't you also read five verses before and five verses after? 
uh, why don't you read the chapter that it's in? And better yet, for instance, if you're in 1 Timothy, why not read the entire book? Read the entire book. You'll get a feel for what it is that Paul is trying to say to Timothy. Remember, these were real people. They lived in real places. Real things happened. They lived in a real society. Every bit as real as the one that you and I live in right now. And so context, you can get a feel for that by reading more widely. If you read further in the other portions of the Bible that cover the same topics as what you're studying in a given text. And of course, the ultimate context is if you read the entire Bible. Now I realize some people say, oh boy, I can't do that. Remember, don't be impatient. Take your time. Read the great themes of Scripture. Get a good background in that which is simple to understand so that when you come to that which is not so easy to understand, you have a good feel for the overall context of the Bible. There's another kind of context you should pay attention to, and that's the historical context. Uh, what's that one about? Well, sometimes it overlaps with the context we just talked about. It, it's the W questions. Who, what, where, when, those types of things. Uh, for instance, 1 Timothy. Who was it written to? Uh, when was it written? Do we know that? Well, actually, we can come pretty close to knowing when 1 Timothy was written by Paul. Uh, where was it written? What were the circumstances in Paul's life that were going on? All of these things can be learned by reading either in the Bible or sometimes by getting some other sources outside of the Bible, maybe a Bible encyclopedia, which again are also available online. These are important questions. If you skip context, you're going to make mistakes. Number four, keep in harmony with the rest of the Bible. This one is huge. The Bible was written over a period of 1,500 years by more than 40 different authors ranging in uh, uh, jobs from being shepherds to kings to doctors, a whole, a whole slew, this, this vast spectrum, and yet we believe that God is the ultimate author of all Scripture. It's His Holy Spirit that inspired the Bible to be read. Therefore, He's not going to contradict Himself. If the Bible says in one place that the Sabbath, for instance, is from uh, the sixth day of the week sundown to the seventh day of the week sundown, if that is the seventh day, and then someone else comes and says, no, it's on the first day of the week, that is incorrect. It is incorrect because of this rule of harmony. If I have an interpretation of a certain portion of the Bible, say, for instance, 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 15, that contradicts what the Bible has revealed elsewhere, then I can be sure that I am not yet finished studying what the meaning of that particular passage is. Does that make sense? Nod your head if you think so. Okay. Harmony is really, really important. Number five, use good sense. <laughs> Now, if somebody can point me to a store that I can buy five cups of this, let me know, okay? Good sense. We use our best good sense, and sometimes we need to bring in other people. Uh, if our snake handling friends had used good sense, more of them would be alive today to tell you the story, okay? Using good sense is important when we come to the Bible. It's not the only consideration by far, because sometimes good sense is mistaken. But it's indispensable to studying the Word. And number six, be patient. Uh, you know, there are some portions of the Bible that personal belief, you don't have to agree with me, my personal belief is there are some portions, very few, but some portions of the Bible that we will not fully understand until we get to heaven. I, I, I look at the seven trumpets of the book of Revelation. I can tell you some stuff about it, but I can't tell you all about it. And I think there's going to be a long, there's going to be the question line in heaven, right? We're all going to visit and talk and line in there. And, and, and at the front will be Jesus sitting there patiently taking our questions one after another. It's going to be great because we're finally going to get those questions answered. But if you refuse to wait, if you are impatient and you say, I will find an answer, and here's what I think it is, before the evidence supports your conclusion, you're probably headed for trouble. Be patient. Be humble. Be willing to wait. That means that sometimes you're just going to have to let questions sit in your head. Now sometimes that drives us nuts, doesn't it? I want to know the answer. I want to know the answer. But be patient. God knows what we need. and He will make it clear in his time. Now, with these things in mind, uh, I wonder if we could take this back to our text, 1 Timothy chapter 2. I'd like you to look it up this time if you would. It's page 839 in your blue Bible. Page 839, 1 Timothy, chapter 2, verses 11 to 15. Now, we're going to see if we can apply these six rules here. And I'm going to tell you right up front, we're going to miss some stuff. 
Uh, the Apostle Paul uh, could preach uh, for hours and hours until people fell out of windows and died, okay? But I only get about 40 minutes with you on a Sabbath morning, okay? So we're going to miss some stuff. If I miss your favorite uh, uh, thought or objection or affirmation, come and see me afterwards. Be glad to talk with you about it, okay? But we're going to do our best to at least get a bird's eye view here of how we could apply these rules. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Let's read it again. Verse 11. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She must be silent. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Now, right off the bat, we are going to violate rule number, rule number one. We do not have the time this morning to read it several times. Uh, we don't have the time to uh, look at original languages by going online to one of these online sites. Uh, so, my apologies. I'm going to leave it to you to read this, to read the wider context, etc., for this particular book. Uh, I'm going to hopefully plant some seeds, and you can finish growing them here later on. But I do want you to notice carefully, at th this at very least... What is the interpretation of this passage if we do no interpretation? If we just take it as being applicable equally to all people, under all conditions, at all times, in all cultures, every place. If we do that, here are some of the conclusions that we must draw from this text. Uh, no woman is to be allowed to teach a man. That was pretty clear. Uh, no woman is to have authority over a man. That was also fairly clear there. All women attending church must be at all times silent. Teaching, again, is forbidden. Uh, the roots of this silence requirement go back to creation. Because Adam was created first, all men have preeminence over all women. Remember, we've moved beyond worship now because Paul here goes back to the creation story. That, that applies to everybody, right? Right? Because, uh, these roots also go back to the fall because Adam was not deceived, but Eve was. As punishment, all women are to be in submission to all men under all conditions and at all times, not merely during worship services. And a final conclusion, ladies, just in case you were giving up hope completely, women, however, can still be saved if they have children and are well behaved while doing so. No children, no salvation. Now, I have some friends that would agree heartily with the first portion of what I read. But they would say, oh, you're going too far with this last part here about childbearing. That, that, that's just not true. Anybody with good sense, oh, now that's interesting, would not go that far. Ladies and gentlemen, this is entirely consistent if we are going to take one portion of the text as applying universally to all people at all times equally without interpretation, what possible justification could we have for suspending that little rule when we get to the end of the chapter? The answer is there's none. So we must be consistent. Okay? And if we are consistent, ladies, your chance for salvation comes through having children and you need to be well behaved while doing so. Now, some of you are undoubtedly already noticing that if we use our rules of interpretation correctly, this interpretation, or I shouldn't even call it an interpretation, this, this taking at face value has some problems with it, doesn't it? If we use those rules of interpretation correctly. Uh, for instance, uh, the harmony rule demands, just to remind you, that the interpretation of one text cannot contradict the interpretation of another because God is the ultimate author. He does not contradict himself. So let's do a little research here using the harmony rule. Uh, are there times, for instance, in the Bible when women speak during worship with the Lord's blessing? There are. In fact, the, one of the first ones that came to my mind is, is 1 Corinthians 11.5. That Paul is the same author who's writing there as was 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 to 15. And there Paul clearly shows that not only does he expect women to pray in a worship service, he expects them to prophesy. Now, last I checked, that is not a silent activity. In fact, prophets have 
Well, we'll talk more about that in just a moment. They've got some pull, don't they? You can think of the stories of prophets, right? Of what happened in the Bible. Uh, there's also Acts chapter 1 verse 14. You remember Acts chapter 1. This is where Jesus is with his disciples. Uh, he ascends up into heaven. The disciples return to Jerusalem, but they don't go by themselves. There's a group apparently of about 120. And in verse 14 we find it says, They joined together constantly in prayer. In other words, this is, this is what worship services were back then. It wasn't pews and formal program and that type of a thing. It says, the disciples joined together constantly in prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus. Now, it doesn't say so specifically, but it does make very good sense, there's that rule again, that when you get to Acts chapter 2 and the tongues of fire fall in that upper room where they're all praying together, that those women are still there, participating actively. Do we find portions of Scripture Furthermore, where women have authority over men and God approves of the arrangement. Yes. Emphatically, yes. Uh, Esther. Her story is found in the book of Esther, right? Uh, she was a person that undoubtedly had authority over men, and just to be blunt, even to the point of having one of them executed. Haman, for his crimes, right? Right? And the Lord is the one that ordained this. It's very clear that Esther was, she was brought to this position by the providence of God himself. How about Deborah? Judges chapter 4 is where you find her story. Deborah was a judge in Israel. In other words, she was someone that men would bring cases, legal cases to, and she would render judgment, and it was binding on them. Now, I, I've had some people critique this, and they, and they say, well, the only reason that God chose a woman for that job is because it was a time of great apostasy in Israel and a, an appropriate man could not be found. All I can say is 1 Timothy 2 verses 11 to 15 doesn't say that. It doesn't say that I do not allow a woman to have authority over a man unless it's a time of national apostasy and a good man can't be found. Then it's okay. It doesn't say that. Instead, it says, I do not allow a woman to have authority over a man. And yet here is a very clear instance where not only does Deborah have authority over a man, but over men in general. And God is the one who ordained it. And how about Mary, the mother of Jesus? John chapter 2. She has this interaction with Jesus there. Uh, this is the, uh, the story of the miracle of turning water into wine. And she comes to Jesus and basically says, can you work this out? And Jesus says, ah, it's not my time to do this yet. And Mary turns to the servants, which must have been men because they're being called to carry these large water jugs. And she says, do whatever he tells you to do. She had authority over those men. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, oh, but they were servants. Of course she had authority. No, 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 no. If you take this literalistic interpretation of 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 15, it doesn't say, I do not permit a woman to have authority over a man, unless the men are servants. It doesn't say that. And so here we have Mary, the, the very mother of Jesus, clearly having authority over men. And obviously God approved. After all, the water became wine. Do we find women teaching men in the Bible with God's approval? Well, yes we do. And we find it here. Remember I said I was going to talk a little bit more about this. Uh, in this notion of prophetess. Uh, there were male prophets and female prophetesses. They both had the same role. Now, now I put it here under teaching. But, but let's be honest. When Samuel, for instance, showed up to Saul and David... Did he come to give a little memo and say, if you feel like it, you probably ought to do this? Prophets had authority even over kings because God made it that way. There were prophetesses such as Anna in Luke chapter 2, verses 36 to 38. There we find Anna the prophet as being one of the very first people to greet the Messiah, baby Jesus there in the temple. Uh, Philip's four daughters, Acts chapter 21, verse 9. They were uh, prophetesses. They were unmarried. They, they lived there with Philip in the house there. And they were prophetesses, which meant that they had, by definition, a teaching role and authority over men. And probably one of the most striking roles of this is Huldah 
Now, Hulda is not a very popular name in Western society. There's not a lot of girls that are born that are named Hulda. It's unfortunate because the legacy that Hulda leaves is pretty hard to ignore. In Second Chronicles chapter 34, verses 22 to 28, this is where we find kind of the, 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 the apex of her uh, ministry as a prophetess. She is called upon by the king's court to get a message to resolve the situation that they're in. It was a time of great apostasy. And Hulda gets a message from the Lord and she says, tell the one who sent you. <laughs> well, the one who sent those people was the king himself, the king of Judah. And she gives this very authoritative message back, at the very least, to teach the king, a man, what he should do. And probably, yes, she had authority over him in that particular instance. Add to all of this that as we learned back on May 13 of this year in a sermon entitled The Making of Mr. and Mrs. Wright, we learn there that the creation story shows that Adam and Eve were equals without a hierarchy of Adam over Eve. When the story is described of their creation, Adam and Eve are both given the same task. God says to them, uh, go, go out and have dominion over the earth, rule the earth and subdue it. He doesn't just say it to Adam. He doesn't just say it to Eve. He says it to both of them. This is their equal task. So prior to the fall, there is no hierarchy. There is no headship. There is no authority of a husband over his wife. They are equals. You may even recall some of the uh, quotations that we put on the screen. Uh, Ellen White uh, wrote this, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 46. It says, Eve was created from a rib taken from the side of Adam, signifying that she was not to control him as the head, nor to be trampled under his feet as an inferior, but to stand by his side as his what? As his equal, to be loved and protected by him. Isn't that interesting? Some have said that, well, because Eve was taken uh, from that rib, that means that she was inferior because she came from man and therefore it was subservient to him even before sin entered the world. Not so. Not so. Some people say, well, because Adam was created first, that meant uh, that he has preeminence even before the fall. Well, if order of creation is what determines the value and the authority, then animals and dirt both have more authority than humanity does. There is equality prior to the fall. Uh, going on here, this is uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 59. She says, in the creation, God made her, meaning Eve, the equal of Adam. There it is again. Had they remained obedient to God in harmony with his great law of love, they would ever have been in harmony with each other, but sin had brought discord, and now their union could be maintained and harmony preserved only by submission on the part of the one or the other. So when does the submission come in? Before or after the entrance of sin? After, that's right, not before. Before there was this equality between the two. But afterwards, yes, there is this hierarchical arrangement going on. Eve had been the first in transgression and she had fallen into temptation by separating from her companion contrary to the divine direction. It was by her solicitation that Adam sinned and she was now placed in subjection to her husband. Now means that before they ate the fruit, there was no subjection to her husband. But after they ate the fruit, yes, that is when there came this arrangement. Because sadly, when sin enters the world, so does selfishness. The two are essentially synonymous. Someone has to lead out. And gentlemen, let me just remind you of one thing. We saw in that sermon back in May that this leadership that the wife is supposed to submit to is the same type of sacrificial leadership that Jesus showed for the church. If you're lording it over your wife, you don't know what you're doing. You don't know. You don't know the job that God has called you to. We are called to sacrifice as we lead our spouses, our families, if we have them, to lead, to protect, to provide. That is the leadership, that is the authority that God has granted to husbands. And we must do it just as Jesus sacrificed himself for the church. That's a pretty high standard, isn't it? Ladies, those of you that are still looking for a husband, don't settle for anything less. Now these things are extremely important, but we do have a little bit of a sticky wicket, don't we? Because we have been reading some quotations from a woman. Ellen White was a female. Surprise. 
She was also a prophet of God, I believe, a true one. And as such, she had authority over men. I've had some of my friends say, well, the only reason that she had authority over men is because men gave her that authority. To which I say, that's not what a literalistic interpretation of 1 Timothy chapter 2 says. It doesn't say, I do not permit a woman to have authority over a man unless the man chooses to give her that authority. It doesn't say that. And so it's not an option for us. The fact of the matter is, is that Ellen White and many other women through history have been given by God authority over men and women and children because of the message and the ministry that they were given to do. And the fact that there have been more men in history given that role does not mean that women are not eligible for it if God decides. I'll tell you what, if God decides to call a woman and I say no, I think I have the privilege of changing my point of view. For all of these reasons and more, the context rule, the harmony rule, and the good sense rule both seem to point to the need for a different interpretation of 1 Timothy 2 than the one that we looked at earlier. So let's see what we can do. Uh, if we do use our rules of interpretation as best we can, admittedly we're skipping some stuff here because we just don't have the time. If we use though some of those six basic rules of Bible interpretation, what might we come up with as a possibility? I'm going to give you two of them this morning very quickly. And I'm going to tell you something at the very beginning. The truth of the matter is, is that rule number six is probably the most important one here. Be patient. Because the facts are, we do not know with 100% certainty exactly what Paul meant in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 to 15. You want to know why it is that Christianity has been able to argue over the role of women in ministry so long? This is why. Because we cannot come down with absolute certainty to what Paul is saying in some of his statements. I readily admit it. I hope you do too. And so we must be patient as the Lord works things out. But we do know what the meaning of this passage cannot be. We just spent some time doing that. We know that it cannot mean that all women under all circumstances and all times and places and all cultures must be subservient to all men. We know it can't mean that. We know it can't mean that, that no women can ever have authority or teach or, or, or ever enter those types of leadership positions. We know it can't mean that because God himself has made women in, to take those roles. Well, so what might it mean? Two possibilities. There are more. Let me just share two of them with you this morning. Number one. It is possible, quite likely, that Paul is addressing a cultural concern that is not equally valid in every place, culture, or time. It is possible that Paul is addressing a cultural concern that is not equally valid in every place, culture, or time. Now, let me flesh that out a little bit here. It is well known that women did not enjoy the same status as men did back in the first century. In fact, there were many practices back during that time that were different than what we have today. And it's interesting that neither the early Christian church nor Jesus Christ himself addressed them. Case in point, slavery. If you want to find a text in the Bible that says, Thou shalt not own another human being. Sorry friends, it's not there. You can't find it. But what you can find are principles rightly used that would undermine over time those practices. Let me put a little flesh on that for you. Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 7, pages 295 and 296. It says, the scriptures exhort Christians to do everything decently and in order. 1 Corinthians 14, 40. In the days of Paul, custom required that women be very much in the background. Therefore, if women believers had spoken out in public or otherwise made themselves prominent, these scriptural injunctions would have been violated and the cause of God would, have thus, would thus have suffered reproach. Now understand what they're saying. If they had chosen, in this case, to violate this norm, that women remain in the background, people looking on from the outside of Christianity would have been so distracted by the breaking of this social norm that they would have ignored the gospel. 
Ellen White echoes this, Acts of the Apostles, page 459. Uh, speaking of Paul's statements on slavery, she says, It was not the apostle, meaning Paul's work, to overturn arbitrarily or suddenly the established order of society. To attempt this would be to prevent the success of the gospel. But he taught principles which struck at the very foundation of slavery and which, if carried into effect, would surely undermine the whole system. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, he declared. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 17. Now, obviously, we need to be very careful here. We can't simply declare something in the Bible that we don't particularly like or understand to be, quotes, cultural. Can't do that. That's why there are six methods, rules for interpretation that I give you, not just one. But when we come to something like 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 to 15, we need to pay close attention to this possibility that it may be a cultural instance that Paul is addressing. It may be that Paul is looking into the church at Ephesus. That's where Timothy is at when he receives this letter. We know that from chapter 1 of 1 Timothy. And did you know the context there is that there were false teachers that had weaseled their way into the Christian church. And among other things, we're not entirely sure all that they were teaching, but we do know this. They were teaching that the kingdom of God was exclusive based on your heredity, based on genealogy. If you didn't match the right genealogical chart, if you didn't have the right uh, uh, papa and grandpappy, etc., etc., you couldn't be part of the kingdom of God. And they had weaseled their way into the worship services of the Ephesus church. If Paul had allowed the social norms of the day to be overturned with impunity, oh yeah, go ahead, women stand, make whatever noise you want, it would have been so distracting, potentially, to the other people in that society that they would have ignored the gospel. Oh, that Christians would learn how to rightly apply this principle because isn't it interesting, for instance, Jesus lived in one of the more corrupt political environments of his day and yet he said almost nothing about the Romans. Almost nothing. The very nation that was essentially not enslaving but ruling over his people, the Jews, and Jesus says almost nothing to them? You know, today it seems like too many Christians think that the purpose of God is to elect their candidate to political office. Apparently Jesus didn't get the memo. He was utterly unconcerned about those things, even though it was corrupt, even though it was oppressing his people, because Jesus came to save people, not to elect them to a political party. That's a good lesson for today, I think. So it could be that Paul here is addressing a culturally conditioned situation. And so because he wants to keep things on the level so that the gospel can move forward, he gives this counsel that he does. It is not universally applicable, therefore, to all situations everywhere, though there may be principles there that we can take. A second possibility of interpretation of 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 15. Paul is not addressing all women and all men, but specifically disrespectful wives and their husbands in church. Now this to me is fascinating, and this is where if we are not impatient, but instead patient and we study, we will find some very interesting things in 1 Timothy 2. Uh, remember rule number two, define key terms correctly? Well, we need to do some good defining in this text. Did you know, for instance, that the Greek word for woman it's gune, okay? And it can be translated as woman or wife. Woman or wife. Same word. Uh, the Bible splits it almost 50-50. There's a slight dominance to translate it in the New Testament as woman, but wife is not far behind. How do you tell which one to use? Context. Context. The same thing is true for the Greek word aner. It's where we get our English word man, but it can also be translated as husband. Same word. Exactly the same word. Context will tell you, should it be translated as man or should it be translated as husband? Now, isn't that interesting? If we were going to use our context and good sense rules and apply these words wives and husbands in 1 Timothy 2. Again, it's entirely linguistically acceptable. This is not a stretch at all. Let's see what happens when we read this text. 1 Timothy chapter 2 
And let me do a little altering here. Verse 11. A wife should learn in quietness and full submission. And the context here is in church, okay? Now, isn't that interesting? Have you ever been... Don't raise your hand. <laughs> Have you ever been in a Sabbath school class where a wife takes her husband to the cleaners? Well, you won't believe what, 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 what so-and-so did this week, my, whoever, whatever her husband's name is. Ah, I left his socks on the sink once again, you know. Uh, well, I wish my husband would just work harder, you know. I've been in some of those Sabbath school classes. You know what I think she, that woman ought to do? Be quiet. Be quiet. And the same thing would be true for a man, by the way, if he's taking his wife to the cleaners in a Sabbath school class. Okay? Now, isn't it interesting? A wife should learn in quietness and full submission. You see, if we leave it as women, the Bible does not give a command that all women are to be submissive to all men. Praise the Lord. But the Bible does say, wives... Submit to your husbands. Now we have a purpose for that last word in verse 11. A wife should learn in quietness and full submission. Verse 12, I do not permit a wife to teach or to have authority over her husband. She must be silent. Now that word for authority is really important. It occurs a grand total of one time in the, in the Bible. Only here. And as far as we can tell, only four times prior to this book being written, in other Greek literature that we have, written in Greek. It's a very rare word. You see, the standard word for authority, exousia, uh, Paul uses that all the time. But so do other Bible writers. It's, it's very common. But he doesn't use it here when he says, I, I do not allow this uh, having of authority. Instead, he chooses this other very rare word. If you look the word up, it means usurping authority domineering, lording over someone that you don't normally have authority to do so. Well, that would make perfect sense in the context of a wife and husband relationship. Because again, back after the fall, God says to Eve, your desire will be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Now again, we've already talked about the quality of that rulership, etc. This is not you know, despotic, dictator type of stuff. But this now may, begins to make more sense here. I do not permit a wife to teach or to usurp authority over her husband because that's not the gospel order. And apparently these Ephesian women in church, because of these false teachers that were stirring stuff up, they were standing up in Sabbath school class or whatever it is that they had back then and were attempting to put their husbands in their place. Verse 13. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. Let's read it now with husband and wife. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. Isn't it interesting that they're married, a husband and wife? And Adam was not the one deceived. It was his wife who was deceived and became a sinner. Hmm. Some people have said that Paul here is using this rule of firsts. Adam was made first. Eve was made second. Therefore, that's why women need to be quiet in church. But we've already seen how this first in creation doesn't mean having authority over. Did you know Paul uses almost the exact same phrase when he talks about the second coming of Jesus? He says, uh, when he talks about the second coming, he says there in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he says, uh, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who remain will be caught up together with them with the Lord in the air, and so we shall be with the Lord forever. Tell me, does that mean that those that died in the Lord and are raised have authority forever over those that were, are still living at the second coming? No. Paul is describing the order of events, not who has authority over whom. Paul here is looking back at the creation story. And it's like he's saying, okay, listen, y'all having troubles there at the Ephesus church. Let me tell you a story. Uh, you remember, uh, Adam was created first, and then Eve was created, and then there came this deception. Eve fell into deception. Adam was not deceived. He sinned in full knowledge of what he was doing wrong. But Eve was deceived. That interpretation is supported very well by Genesis chapter 3. Ellen White concurs. It was after the fall, because Eve had been deceived, Yes, then this hierarchy was put into place, but not before. If we continue reading, verse 15, but women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. 
You know, my guess is that those reading and listening to this probably understood exactly what Paul was trying to say. Here is what I think is our best guess, or one of our best guesses, I should say. The word for through, women will be saved through childbearing. First of all, we know that that cannot be true. If we mean by through, we mean by. In other words, a woman having children will place herself in the kingdom of heaven. Okay, that's not true. We are saved by Jesus Christ, not by C-section. Okay? That, it just doesn't work that way. So, so it can't mean this. It cannot mean that women will be saved by child. If you're a woman and you never have children, what, are we going to exclude you from the kingdom? Is Jesus going to say, no, my sacrifice? Of course, that's silliness. Good sense rule. It's a good rule. So what does it mean? Well, the word for through childbirth, childbearing, uh, it's the word dia. It just got three letters in it in Greek. And it can also mean as you go through. Like traveling through time, basically, as you go through an experience. And you know what? That makes some sense. Remember, Paul is pointing back to Genesis 1 through 3. What happened after Adam and Eve ate the fruit? God comes, he does a little investigation, and then he tells them what the results will be now. One of the results that God says to the woman, to Eve, I will greatly increase your pain in childbirth. But just a few verses earlier, speaking of the results of childbirth, God himself had said to Eve that through her seed, a Messiah will come. In other words, it may well be that Paul is reminding his female listeners there in the church in Ephesus, you're making some mistakes. You're making a ruckus in church. You need to sit down. You need to be quiet so there'll be order in this church service. But if that sounds harsh to you and you feel like your lot in life of raising children, having children, the, the work involved in families, if you think that's difficult, just remember the Messiah came through that pain. Mary did have a baby, and that baby, Jesus Christ, still offers salvation to you ladies today. It could well be that that's what Paul is pointing back to. He's not addressing all women and all men at all times and all cultures, but he's specifically addressing these husbands and wives there in the church in Ephesus. There is a third option, but I'm going to save that for another day. It takes a little longer. It's fascinating. But we'll be interested to see it. Perhaps I'll share that with you at some time. Until then, I want us to remember at least this, though. In just a little while, annual council will meet. I think it has the potential to be one of the most important annual councils that the church has had for generations. I am not one that claims to know what is going to happen. No, I, I, I will not make that claim. I'm not even uh, saying that I know that there will be uh, dire consequences if things go south at this council. But I am saying that the stakes are high. There is a great deal that will be under discussion at this council. And at the bottom of it all will be how do we rightly interpret the Bible? I want to invite you to pray for our church leadership, that they will have a good meeting, that it will bear positive fruit, not merely for them, but for all of the Lord's work all over the world. And I'd like you to pray specifically that neither we nor they will let impatience move us to places that we should not go. May instead this council and our own lives be such that we exemplify Jesus Christ above any personal agenda that we may have. I don't know what the outcome of this council will be, but I do know that more than anything, and I think I can probably speak for you as well, that we want Jesus Christ to be lifted up and his mission to go forward. Let us pray in that direction. Father in heaven, you have given us the Bible as a great light that shines in the darkness. 
But I pray, first of all, that, that we would take the Bible seriously, that we would not just let it sit on the shelf and gather dust, Lord, regardless of whatever topic it is we're discussing. I pray that our lives would be ones that are built on your word. And Lord, we do also pray specifically for the counsel that is coming up. We pray for wisdom. We pray for, pray for, for kind hearts, Lord, for no impatience, but instead that there would be a spirit of love, of truth, of unity, and that your spirit, Lord, and your spirit alone would have its way at that council. Bless us, Lord, in this way, for we have asked it in your name. Amen.